Good afternoon, everybody. We'd like to thank everyone on for attending today's webinar and being a part of the UAS Magazine's webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Real World Challenges for AI in Vision Applications. And joining us today on our webinar, we are pleased to have Danny Longball, Vice President of Sales at Teledyne Luminera. And I have to say, I had the privilege of chatting with him yesterday about his presentation and getting to know him a little bit. And, and I was happy to see he's got some exciting information to share with everyone on today's webinar. Um, you know, during our, our webinar today, we'll be addressing how advancements in artificial intelligence and particularly in deep learning have accelerated the prolification of vision-based applications. The focus of this presentation will be on lessons learned in trying to harness the potential of AI from the point of view of a developer and integrator of vision solutions. And so before I hand over the reins of Danny and let him begin, I'd like to share a little bit about him with you. And I do want to just remind everyone that we do have a section for questions. Uh, you can send your questions in and we'll try to address some of those at the end if we have time. Uh, if they aren't answered, we'll forward them on to Danny, or you can contact him directly. And so, a little bit about Danny, uh, is, um, you know, as we got to know him, Danny is the Vice President of Sales at Teledyne Luminera. Spanning a 25-year career, Danny has built expertise in imaging technology designed specifically for rugged, mission-critical environments. While most recently focused on advanced machine vision technologies, Danny's previous assignments included research and design projects for fighter and reconnaissance aircraft electronic technologies. Wow, that's, that's impressive. So without further ado, Danny, take it away. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, to set the stage a bit, I'd like to talk a bit first about where we're coming from, like Teledon Luminar. Uh, we are actually uh, camera manufacturers. Uh, we do machine vision cameras. Uh, those are used in all kinds of different applications, aerial imaging being a, a key one for us. Uh, but we also do traffic, transportation. We do military programs. Uh, we do a lot of automation, a lot of life sciences as well. So today, actually, you, you find cameras just about everywhere. Um, so it's really a, a good market to be into. It's a good line of products to be into, very good technology. Uh, we've been doing that since 2002. So really, we're not new at this game. Uh, we, we, we've seen technology evolve. We've seen new things happening. And AI, obviously, is one of these new things that is happening recently. Uh, we've been part of Teledyne now. We got acquired by Teledyne almost two years ago, or a year and a half ago. And for us, that has really allowed us to, to expand our capabilities. Uh, Teledyne is a much larger corporation with network around the world. And there's a lot of different components, imaging technology that uh, we've been able to, to get familiar with uh, now being part of Teledyne. Oops, just a bit too far. So why are we talking about uh, about AI today? Um, the first thing is that AI, um, no, I've been around for a while. Um, I think that first came up in the 50s and the 70s and 80s. Uh, there was a lot of talks and possibilities around AI and all of those actually fizzled away at some point. It's just that the all the different components, all the different technology needed to make it happen were just not in place back in those days. Things are different today. Uh, because of the combination of software, hardware, applications, AI now is certainly here to stay. The other key reason to talk about AI and why AI is so popular uh, is because more and more uh, different companies, different groups, are looking for ways to differentiate their solutions. And AI is a good way to introduce differentiations. It's really a, a center of innovation. There's a lot of new things, new capabilities 
that are being unlocked uh, by AI. So for that reason, we see it appear in all kinds of different applications, uh, way beyond aerial imaging, uh, but also uh, in, in scientific applications, in track applications, in security applications. So AI will touch us uh, in many different aspects of our life. We see it today, and we're only going to see it more and more. The focus of my talk is going to be on the lessons we've learned about AI, ourselves taking on an AI project. So I think one of the things I should be doing is describe a bit what we did in terms of AI. Why did we get into that? Uh, the project we've taken on. And, and from there, then I'm going to get into the lessons uh, we've learned to this project. So the project we got into is traffic related. It, it was about uh, adding AI capabilities within a camera. Like I said earlier, we do cameras. And more and more people want to add more capabilities to their cameras. They want to do processing at the edge or they want it into a self-contained systems like, like uh, an unmanned system solutions, for example. The project we got into was about traffic, was about vehicle detections, what about license plate, uh, being able to read a license plate on a car, being able to detect the type of cars, pedestrians and other things going on in the road. Uh, that was our goal and, and to do all of this right in the camera. So we had to bring different software capabilities, but a lot of it was also about putting the hardware together and then taking into consideration the applications that we were trying to do. And for that type of applications, the uh, specifications were really demanding, actually. You, you When you do traffic, when you do license plate, accuracy is really, really important. Uh, so we had a very really high target in terms of being able to read license plate correctly. I think I've seen number like 95%, 97%, 99% of the time. And being outside, being traffic, uh, you have to understand that the conditions can vary a lot, which makes the problem only harder. So lighting condition, weather conditions, all things that you don't control, unlike, let's say, an automation type of program where you control a lot of these variables. So you don't uh, in an outdoor system which puts huge challenges uh, for us to, to, to build such a solution. So this is why we got, we got into this. Um, and one of the first lessons we learn is that when you get into AI, it's a very different world. Uh, you have to understand we're coming at this, we have our engineers, so we have actually a, a pretty strong engineering team in our company. Uh, it's a big component of our corporation. A very knowledgeable people, very good people. So we got into this, and, and then we realized that when you talk about AI, it's very different from the ways you've been doing things before. So it's not just like taking on one more project. It's not like taking on one more engineering project. It's a totally different way of doing things. Uh, in computer vision, uh, things have evolved through the years, and, and a lot of it is very really you know, program-driven, software-driven. All these concepts goes back a long time. They're well-known. There's ways to do things. There's best practices. And all of this now, or a lot of it, did not apply anymore. We really had to learn new things. We had to learn new ways of doing things. So it's not only the new technologies. It's also how you make things happen. Uh, just understanding like the things you need to know. Uh, by itself is it, it, something different. Uh, so it was a bit of a challenge for us to, to, to get our team in that different mindset that we needed to, to take on uh, such a program. If I look at traditional machine vision, which is the world where we're coming from. Uh, so when you write, a system and applications. Uh, first of all, uh, your development techniques, uh, they follow a very clear process. You start with specifications, you do a system design of some sort, 
Uh, you split your thing in different components. You gain so there's only the components. Uh, you build the thing, you test the thing. Uh, you deploy, maybe sometimes you go back to, to, to changing a bit. So there's some iteration built in. Uh, you also know that when you deal with machine vision, everything parameters are well defined. So I don't know why this is changing all the time, but it's changing by itself. <laughs> uh, so uh, in machine vision, uh, things uh, are, are very well defined. So you, when you write a piece of software, you have your software structure, you go from one module to the next. People understand these concepts. Execution is very well understood. In AI, things are totally different. Then you come to realize that actually you don't actually write code the way that you used to do in, in traditional machine vision. Now you're talking about data, you're talking about training, you have to validate your data, you have to validate the results. Uh, everything is really domain specific. Unless a piece of code that you can reuse, for example, if you do vehicle detection, well, it's still a block of some sort. So if you've done some kind of Plug analysis before you can probably apply a lot of that to your vehicle detection. Uh, in AI, it doesn't matter because that's not how you're going to do that. You're going to be actually taking some data that you're going to feed to an engine of some sort to train that engine. And, and once you're done training that engine, you're going to pour that engine into your execution machine, basically. So very different concepts, very different ways of looking at things. And that can be a challenge where you're not coming from this world, you just don't understand. What am I supposed to do here? So that has been a big challenge for us. And I guess being so strong at machine vision, maybe it was only a drawback because we came at this with very well specified ways of doing things only to realize that, oh, it's really different in this world. We have to learn different ways. One example actually from this slide is just the concept of training versus inference. We didn't know what it was. When we got into this, just understand this took a bit of time. Training being the portion where you take your data and, and you feed that data into your engine, you train it. And once you've done that training phase, what you've done on that hardware, on that system, then you take that and you put it in a different system where you only do your inference now, where you actually don't have to input so much data, you just input images. And out of that, uh, the logic of the systems gives you results. So that's the inference part. And we just did not understand that even from the start. So these concepts took a while to understand and we had to adapt a bit the way we, we, do, we do our work. And, and one thing we did actually, we brought somebody from the outside. Uh, we just added more people to our team, to our engineering team, people that were a bit more versed than we were in that domain. Uh, to just get us going. So when I talk about data, if you look at AI just a little bit, you, you're going to hear that data is really important. So we have a system, you train a system. In our case, we train our system with vehicles and license plate and all these things. So the better the training is, the better your results are going to be. That's, that's a known fact. But what, the, what does that mean anyway? Uh, in reality is that most AI implementation fail because of data quality. People would say that, uh, would say that, oh, AI is not good for me. It just doesn't work. And it wasn't that AI did not work really. Most of the time it would be that it was not trained properly. Uh, you'd be surprised how much you can achieve with AI with a system which is properly trained. But even that, what does that mean? So what we found is that first thing, you need images that truly represent how the system is going to be used in the real world. And, and that's one challenge by itself. When you go from your lab, building your systems, and you go to the real world, well, these images, again, I don't know why it's changing size all the time, but it does by itself. Uh, the, these images uh, can be very different in, in the real world. So we, we train our system with, with vehicles, different type of vehicles. Uh, we had cars, we had trucks, we had all kinds of things. And, and one thing we ran into actually in the real world is that uh, some of these trucks, the larger one, uh, 
we're filling up the field of view a bit different than the way we have trained the systems. So at that point, the system could not detect a truck anymore because it turned out that the field of view was a bit different than the way we had trained it. So to have images that are representative uh, of how it's going to be in the real world, that's easier said than done because really you have to put yourself in a different mindset and you have to be able to really anticipate how it's going to be when this thing is deployed. When it comes to traffic, another example would be the weather condition. Like uh, we're actually based in Ottawa, Canada. So we have winter, we have snow. If you, you don't train your system with images collected in winter time, what comes winter, they're gonna look different. So your AI is gonna probably be challenged to, to work properly. So you have to be sure you think of all the different conditions of, uh, that you're gonna face in the real world so that your image are representative. They also have to be diversified. Uh, if you look for cars, well, you better train your system with all kinds of different car models instead of just a few. And, and, and the better coverage you have in terms of image diversity, uh, the better your results are going to be. And when you say diversity, you also have to think about the background. It's not only what you're looking for, it's the settings around it. Uh, I did not in this project, but in the front program, uh, I heard of a system where the system was trained um, and you would think you would train the system, let's say to detect your target, let's say a, a, a car or something. But what the system actually was detecting was the background, because the background was always the same, because the system became trained to detect the background instead of the actual target. And obviously there was a problem that was only resolved once the system was deployed. The, the other challenges is the uh, consistency of judgment. So training, when you train a system, how does that work? So you feed images and then somebody has to coach the system. That's a bit annoying as it's changing all the time. Uh, somebody has to coach the system about, hey, there's a vehicle in that image or maybe there's no vehicle, or this is a truck, or this is a pedestrian. It's a bit easier when it comes to vehicles, but depending on your application, that judgment could be hard. Is that object you're trying to detect, are you always gonna have the same type of judgment in that situation? I think a better example would be something we do when we do cameras. So when we do cameras, we always have a quality check at the end, a visual quality check. Somebody looks at the image, a test image, out of the cameras, and, and has to decide, uh, maybe it's some kind of automatic mode, automated mode, I don't know. Uh, somebody has to decide if that image is good quality or not. So you look at the test image, and somebody say, well, this one is not good enough, there's too much noise inside, or maybe there's too many defects in that corner or something. This is a very subjective evaluation. Is somebody looking at it? I actually used to do that that work when I started at Luminara. I was called the last man, I was product manager. I was always the one coming in for the, the difficult situations. And someday I would say, yeah, this image is too noisy, not acceptable, reject. The next day, the next week, the next month, I would come back and who knows, maybe for the same image, I might have come up with a different, uh, a different judgment of that quality at the time and something I rejected last month, I might have accepted uh, that time around. So if this is how I'm gonna train my system, it's gonna be very confusing. The AI is gonna be confused. It won't say anything, but really the way it's gonna be thinking is that how come last month that image was a reject and today it's not a reject, today it's acceptable. So to be consistent in your judgment when you train your system uh, is key. Uh, to have an AI system that works well. The other difficulty we, we ran into, it's again, we're very technical people, our customers are very technical people. Uh, so when we build something, people want to understand, how does that work? How do I go from A to B? 
and if you're not able to clearly explain how you go from A to B, people are struggling to, to trust the system. So how do I know does it work? Well, you know, it's AI. We feed data, we train it, we deploy, it gives you result. I don't have that logical path that I do have with traditional machine vision. And just that was hard. It was hard with our team when it came to test the system. How do I know this working well? It was also hard with our customers. Our customers are difficulty accepting that, yeah, this is a system I can trust. So this concept that you don't really fully understand the mechanics inside takes some time to accept. I think that with time, that will resolve itself. It's something that once AI is widely deployed, uh, that people have good experience with it, uh, it won't be as much of a roadblock, but it is today. It's something that people are struggling with. Image quality. Uh, so image quality is still important uh, for AI. It's still important to have a good image, good image quality, because when you feed your system, the better quality you're gonna have coming in, the better results you're gonna get. The other thing you have to understand is that the way AI looks at things is different than your own eyes looks at things. Um, the dynamic range might be different the ability to perceive lower noise level might be different too. So the fact that the AI sees things a bit differently uh, only means that you have to have the best image quality that you can afford so that you can get uh, the best results out of your system. Uh, again, you might remember I was trying to achieve very high accuracy uh, in our case. Uh, so for us, it was very, very important to get good image quality. I say as much as you can afford, because that comes with some drawback too. Uh, the more accurate the image, the more details there is in the image, um, the, the more intense the processing is going to be. So there's a cost to that too. There's a processing cost. There's a cost in terms of components too. There's a price to, to have more powerful components, better cameras, better processors. But for sure, if you get better quality, you're gonna get better results. AI is not the answer to every question though. Uh, we got into AI not by choice, actually, to tell you the truth. Uh, when we started this program, we did not intend to use AI. We intended to use traditional machine vision. We were going to design codes to detect shapes, like vehicle shapes, pedestrian shapes, and, and going to write code to manage exposure and all these good things. That's how we started. And then we failed. Uh, using traditional machine vision, the best accuracy we could achieve was something like 70, 75%. Uh, we cannot go beyond that, and we tried all kinds of different, different ways to go beyond that. Uh, the, um, when we realized that and could not make it any better, this is when we decided to take the plunge and, and, and come in with uh, AI-based solutions. AI, though, like I said before, can also be a bit more demanding on your processing power. So what we found eventually is that a mix or hybrid solution is uh, was a better solution for us. We uh, we did not fully design the system using AI. When it came to the OCR, so to read the actual uh, characters on the license plate, the Traditional machine vision algorithms work very really well. They're, they're very efficient, they work very really well. The challenge for us was more to actually detect the vehicles and extract the license plate itself. After that, once we got the license plate, uh, to use a, a different engine to actually read it uh, was more efficient. 
so this is how we ended up doing this. Uh, we ended up mixing both traditional machine vision and AI in one solution. Uh, the AI is at the front end. That's the one that actually detects the vehicle, but does that in real time. Uh, once the vehicle are detected, the license plate location is extracted, and, and the license plate is fed to the uh, the traditional OCR engine. This this was the most effective way to do this. By doing this this way, not only did we get better results because uh, the OCR engine was very really good, so not only did we get better results we also became more efficient. So we were able to do more in a more compact system with less CPU power. Uh, remember, we wanted to do everything in cameras. So we have limited resources inside the cameras. So for us to, to find a ways to optimize the use of these resources uh, really allowed us to, to have a successful program. So that's something to think about. Uh, when you get into AI, you might want to think about, do I really need to do AI for all the different things I need to do? Or can I only do it on some of the maybe harder aspect of the system? If I look at hardware architecture now, uh, that's something that, first of all, changes really rapidly. And our program actually took us a while. Uh, this whole program from the early definition of the program, looking at some components early on, uh, starting to put things together, some prototyping, and all the way to the end. It took almost like two years. Uh, so during that two years, one thing we found is that the hardware components we were looking at at the beginning of the program had changed uh, by the end of the program. That's, that's the reality of this world. Things are evolving quickly. There's new GPUs, so there's new graphic processors, there's new FPGAs, so gate arrays that you can program. Uh, there's new software techniques as well. There's new libraries, there's new concepts. So it's great because you get access to all kinds of new and better things. The challenge though when you design something that you actually want to deploy is that how long are these things going to be available? Is by the time that I'm finished, am I going to be offering the best solution possible? Because things might have changed already at that point in time. So this space of change is something you have to take into consideration when you design your system. You have to design a system where you can scale up, where you can come in and a year down the road, two years down the road, you can tweak things a bit without having to redesign the whole thing to benefit from the latest technologies, because it will happen. Uh, I've seen some of these um, GPU platform. I think the expected life cycle of, of these platform GPU boards is just a few years. You, know, you, you design something with these boards today, and in two, three years from now, you cannot get these boards anymore. I think there's some industrial version of these projects that are, committed to a longer life cycle, but even there we're looking at maybe five or six years. For us, where we're coming from in the machine vision, five or six years, still very, very short. Uh, we do have customers today that are still buying from me technology that we've designed 15 years ago. So 15 years is not unheard of. Uh, and I have people asking me sometimes for even longer. So if I get into an AI program and in two years I'm going to, have to change something, that, that can be a problem that uh, certainly needs to be addressed uh, early on. Uh, the other thing about hardware is the, uh, is the difference between uh, the training portion of your system and the implementation of your system and also the type of solution you're looking for. So when you train a system, you're going to train that typically on a host machine. And, and that could be a very beefy, very capable machine. You do that in development. So that's not something you really are going to deploy. So the cost is not as much of an issue at that point. And anyway, you do need the extra capabilities during the training. For your deployment, though, at that point, often you'll be using a leaner machine. It could be embedded, for example. It could also be host-based. You could deploy on a host as well. But in any cases, 
uh, you're going to want to deploy in a probably cheaper systems. Uh, the architecture of these systems is also very different, very different. So if you work with a host-based solution, you're going to be working often in a Windows world with a desktop type of machine, so pretty powerful processors, but the type you find in your desktop computers. If you work with an edge-based device, then you get into very different type of technologies. Uh, you get into devices that could be using graphic processors, and there's a lot of those today, and, and there's new ones becoming available all the time. Or you could be working with an FPGA. I was talking about, that's a field programmable gateway, so there's a programmable chip uh, that has a number of resources built on chip that you can use the way you wish. So all of that though would be hidden from you because what's going to happen is that the actual AI engine is going to run, the data set is going to be loaded, it's going to do its thing. Uh, but when you design all of this, you have to consider which architecture you want to go in with because those are very different from each other. Uh, they also have very different life cycle. I was talking about life cycle before. Uh, FPGA is a more industrial type of technology, so they tend to be around for a long time. Uh, GPU is often a bit more consumer-oriented, so it's shorter uh, life cycle for GPU. They come at different price point, they're scalable different ways, so all those need to be looked at before you make a decision on which one you want to go with. In our case, uh, we did go with an FPGA type of solution. We have a lot of FPG expertise in our company, so for us that was an easier choice than going with GPU. Uh, but we do have to acknowledge that we lost some flexibility uh, by going with an FPGA. Uh, with GPU, it's a bit easier to scale up uh, from one gen to the next. Uh, oops. All right. Uh, longer term, I talk about that. So. Uh, Again, two, three years for GPU-based solutions. FPGA could be 10 years uh, easily. So those are the differences in terms of ability between these different platforms. Uh, what's next? Uh, where is this thing going? What, where is AI going? Uh, it's it, no, What we see today is, is very exciting, but you know, that's not the end. Uh, I, I was talking about how things are evolving quickly and they are. Uh, in many different ways. One question I get often is about, because people use AI as an intelligent system, it must, be, it must be just like a human. So if I deploy an AI solution for traffic, for example, does it learn by itself? Uh, does it learn for its mistake? Maybe it makes mistakes before, and the next time around, does it learn by itself that, oh, I made that mistake, I'm going to fix it the next time around? Uh, no, it, it doesn't. Uh, it, it does learn, but you have to retrain the system with new data, new images, new things, or new new parameters. If you don't retrain the system, it doesn't learn by itself. So whatever is being deployed today, whatever I deploy today will not by itself get better. It will always offer the same level of accuracy. I was talking about my target. Let's say it does 95%. In two months from now, it won't do 96, or it won't do 97. It's still gonna do 95. It's gonna do 95% until our team find a better way to 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 train the system in a different way and improve the accuracy. Until then, it's not learning by itself. That though is quite a potential for the future. Uh, in the future, that's some of the things that are in the works now, where system will be able to learn by themselves. So now there's no more training anymore. Uh, they will learn by themselves. Uh, I do have an example of something like that, a bit outside of what I typically do uh, in my work domain, uh, in the domain of, of gaming, of chess, actually. Uh, and I've seen a system, I used to be a chess player myself, so uh, something that's really caught my attention. Uh, but in the chess, chess domain, uh, the way computer play chess as being the same way machine vision works, what I was describing earlier. So you actually write your code, you use well-known principles, and so you use feedback from some masters that play chess. And, and with these masters, they, they tell you a bit like how to rate a position, and you try to code that in your software, and that's how you, you build a, a chess program. 
and it's been like that since chess programs <laughs> were invent invented. Uh, they've been poor over time. So in the 80s, they were really like poor at playing chess. Uh, and, and by the end of the 90s, or early 2000, like no human could be the best chess program in the world. And all of that was based on that type of approach, uh, coding approach. So with AI, what, what somebody has done, this actually coach the AI on the rules of chess. So there was no data being fed. It wasn't about training. It was really about teaching the AI how the, the rules of chess. And from there, the AI was able to self-learn how to play chess. Because one thing is to know the rule, it's a totally different thing to be able to play the game and win. Uh, so the way that was done is that only the rules were set for the AI, and then the AI got to play chess. At first, it just played against itself. And at first, you would understand it's just random. It doesn't know what to do. So it just plays against itself at random, knowing the rules, though, until it wins and the other side lose. And then it plays again, and again, and again, and again, millions of times. After doing that sort of training for, I think, less than a day, so the AI, once input with the rule of chess, plays again itself for less than a day. At the end of that day, got to play against the best, or one of the best, uh, chess program in the world, the traditional type. And the AI was able to actually beat the traditional program just after a day of self-learning, of going through all the different possibilities, just knowing the rule, and coming up with ways how to best play chess. So self-learning is the next step. Uh, the benefit of self-learning is obviously that this way, uh, you can go beyond what we normally do. Uh, when you do training, you do training within the limit of what you know, what you're looking for. Uh, with self-learning, the AI can find its own ways beyond maybe what human can think about. And, and that's the next thing about the future. The next thing is that AI becomes the teacher in the sense that we don't train the chess program anymore. Uh, we don't train the AI anymore. Uh, we actually learn from it. It becomes our teacher. And, and if I go back to my chess example, the same thing happened there, actually. So after that that day where the AI became so good, was able to beat the latest and greatest traditional chess software, uh, then it got involved in playing a lot more games with different software against people too. In the chess world, like all these things are recorded, so you record a game of chess. And now people have realized that the chess playing AI plays chess very differently than the way that humans play chess. It plays chess in a way that we didn't think about. And now human chess players are learning from the AI's software how to improve their own game of chess. So we went from training the, the AI to the AI training us. And, and that's a fantastic future. <laughs> it opens up so many possibilities. Uh, so this is what's next for AI. It's not for tomorrow. A lot of these things are in the worst day early on. Remember, AI started 50 years ago plus. So there's still a lot of time ahead of us to you know, to reach that next next stage. That's uh, my presentation for today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, John. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Danny. It's always uh, interesting to, to think about what's coming in the future, uh, where things are heading, and, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of opportunity there, and it's it's exciting. So thank you for the presentation. We do have a, a – there's a couple questions here I did want to address, um, and it, it looks like it is regarding your operating systems and what you're compatible with. So can you dive in a little bit more about what – your compatibility with certain 
computer so- uh, operating systems. I, I think you mentioned it briefly, if I recall, but can you go into that in, in a little more depth on your compatibility with operating systems? For sure. So, so because in our case, uh, in that case in particular, there was an embedded platform, you know, AI within a camera or within embedded systems. Uh, we have a lot of our customers building AI on embedded systems. So the OS of choice seems to be more Linux oriented. And we see a lot of people using Linux on embedded platforms to run AI, and, and that works quite well. Uh, there's, there's some Windows too. If you do host base, then more often it's going to be Windows. Uh, but I, we see a lot of we see a lot more people doing embedded than doing Linux. Great, great. Uh, another question here about some of your interfacing. Uh, do you, you know, is it USB? What what interfaces do you use regarding USB with your cameras and transferring that information? So the, the the great thing about uh, using AI is that unlike a camera, a traditional camera, once you have a smart camera, uh, you don't have to output images so much anymore. Um, you tend to output results. So in our case, uh, we would only output, even though the system internally was running at 60 frames per second, collecting all these images and stuff, that's not what the output would be. Uh, we would only output uh, Image, single images of vehicles with the license plate number spelled out. Uh, so because of that, the interface of choice becomes very really different when you work with AI versus a traditional cameras. So we did not have to have high throughput. Typically, if you work at six frames per second, you have high resolutions, you have to have an interface that support high throughput, a lot of data coming out. In that case, uh, that wasn't a requirement. The requirement was more like about distance. It had to be uh, a certain distance because it's mounted uh, in a remote systems. It could be a wireless link, could be different things. Uh, so the output was actually Ethernet in that case. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, there's a couple of technical questions. I have one question. Looks like that was those were the questions. <clears throat> but I, I have a question. I just wanted to ask you, you know, for the for everyone on the webinar, if you could say in a you know few sentences what sets you apart from from your competitors. Uh, it's more certainly the breadth of technology that uh, we have within our organization. Um, so AI by itself is a great thing. Uh, but obviously you have to connect that with other imaging technologies, be it visible imaging, being UV imaging, being thermal imaging. So with our organizations, we're able to bring all these things together. Uh, within Teledyne, we have access to very diversified uh, imaging components, imaging technologies, uh, sensors included too. We do our own sensors as well. So it's really a one-stop shop uh, being able to support our customers uh, from beginning to end. Great, great, thank you. Yeah, by joining Teledyne, you know, combining together Luminera and Teledyne, yeah, it, it opens up the door um, dramatically, I could imagine. So, thank you. Thanks for all your information, and thanks for being on today's webinar. We, before we end here, we do want to do a special thanks to Teledyne Imaging, and you can visit them at www.luminera.com and get more information about what was on today's webinar. And then we also want to just remind everyone about an upcoming event produced by UAS Magazine, and it's the 14th annual UAS Summit and Expo, and it's taking place October 13th through the 14th in, in, in Grand Forks at the Alaris Center. And, uh, you know, last year, you know, this really is a hotbed uh, location in terms of the activity that's happening in the UAS industry. You have a lot of military activity, a lot of commercial activity, um, you know, with the help of, of, uh, of the test site up here as well. That really helps us become what we, you know, what people say is a proving ground for the UAS industry. So we hope you can join us. Last year, we had the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General David Goldfein here. 
Uh, and we also had Bailey Edwards, the FAA Assistant Administrator for Policy and International Affairs and Environment. So again, we try to cut, I know we try to cover both of those sides, uh, both commercial and military. And so it's a very good place to kind of come and check out and uh, explore if you have new technologies that you're trying to bring to market. Uh, with that being said, this recording will be, or this webinar will be recorded. We will have it up and you can access it later on. But if you do have any questions, please submit them to us or give Danny a call. And again, we appreciate you being on and being a part of the UAS Magazine webinar series. Have a great afternoon.